Uh, I'm Dr. Akhtar Hussain, uh, President-elect of the International Diabetes Federation and Professor of Diabetes and um, Metabolic Disorder at the New University, Norway. I'm also affiliated with several other universities, both in, um, uh, both in Bangladesh and also in Brazil. It's a great pleasure for me to be here today, and I thank Dr. Bansi, a, a good friend for a long time, and, and also the organizing committee, my friends and colleagues. I have many friends and colleagues, so I do, I'm not going to use names for of everyone since it will take my 20 minutes of my time. So, so what I'm going to do today and is, is something that burned us actually, where actually I have a great feeling that people all over the world should fight for the access of insulin and which is not available to more than 50% of the people who needs it globally today. And this is something that I will say that for at the very outset, that all people, all clinicians involved in diabetes needs to uh, involve in this because no matter whatever the whatever the advice we give whatever the, the um, uh, um, uh, drugs we prescribe unless they have access to insulin our our whole our effort will be in vain so you say that i will start with the history of insulin because we have some some misunderstanding as i see that in in literature, in literature i see that many people are citing that insulin was discovered in 1922 which is not correct that in 1869 paul langerhans a medical student in berlin discovers a distinct collection of cells within the pancreas later this was called an islets of langerhans that we all know this comes from the discovery of paul langerhans and in 1901, that Eugen Opie discovers that the islet of Langerhans produces insulin and that the destruction of these cells resulted in diabetes. So already in 1901, we knew the cause for this diabetes. And later, the Romanian professor Nikolai Paulsen develops extract of the pancreas and shows that it lowers blood sugar in diabetes dogs. So the experiment was actually given in dogs already in 1916. Then comes 1921, when Dr. Frederick Banting, a medical student, Charles and Best performed the experiments on the pancreas in dogs in Toronto. In 21, we, they again did an experimental trial in a dog. In 1922, a 14-year-old boy with type 1 diabetes called Leonard Thompson. He was given the first medical administration of insulin and survived for another 13 years. He died of another other reason other than diabetes after this uh, after this uh, 13 years. So in Banting and McLeod were awarded the, the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine. Banting and McLeod, however, feel Best and Collip were equally elig eligible and shared the prize money with their other two colleagues. So this was this was the history of 1921. Uh, 22 and 23. That brought us to, to this picture that we, we are talking about Leonard Thompson that you see that on your left hand side that he was before the treatment and after the treatment. At that time, they, it was said that now the modern discoveries, particularly insulin, insulin have completely changed the outlook. There is no reason why a diabetic should not, if he can, be taught to do so, lead a long normal life. Lawrence in 1925. This patent, the patent on January 23rd of 1923, the Banting, Best and Collip were awarded the American patent for insulin. They sold the patent to the University of Toronto for dollar one each. Banting notably said, insulin does not belong to me, it belongs to the world. His desire was for everyone who needs access to it should have it. And then we look at this the, uh, about the impact of the miracle of insulin. You look at this, the pre-insulin era, that is uh, from 1897 to 1922, and then how the life expectancy increased over the years. Then comes the insulin industry. Insulin industry that it was started in 1950. The NPH as an intermediate acting insulin is marketed by Danish pharmaceutical company Novo. 
1950. In 1955, insulin was sequenced by British biochemist Frederick Sanger and was first protein to be fully sequenced. In 1958, Sanger actually received a Nobel Prize in chemistry for his research. In 1963, insulin became the first human protein to be chemically synthesized. And then it comes this insulin industry's history that in 1978, the biotechnology firm Gentech uses the recombinant DNA. In 1982, the synthetic insulin is, is renamed as human insulin. In 1985, Novo Nordisk introduces the insulin pen. 1992, the Med Medtronic releases with Minimed 506. 1996, the Eli Lilly uh, markets the analog insulin, Lispro. And in 2000, more than 470 patients with type 1 diabetes received the Eiler cells transplantation. So you see that that's, that's roughly the insulin histories, and which is very important in the, for, for treating diabetes patients. But if you look at this, the global dominance of three multinationals companies, so who are the, com the companies that were dominating the global market? This is, there are three companies, that is Novo Nordisk, Sanofi and Eli Lilly. And although this data is a little old, but I have checked with the new data, it is from 2011, things have not changed. Actually, you see that, for example, the insulin volume market share for, for Novo is still around 51, 52%. So it has not changed much. So actually the, the global player is three. So we are talking about a, a responsibility of companies and the government, the civil societies and the professionals that who are involved in caring for people with diabetes. So we say that what has happened after this 100 years, that is uh, in terms of access of insulin. So recognizing that insulin is an essential medicine, but kind of, uh, concerned uh, that despite being discovered uh, 100 years ago in 1921, Globally, about half of the people in need of insulin have no or irregular access with unacceptable or inequalities between and within countries. 50% of the people do not have access. And this is while in Sub-Saharan Africa, if you look at South, this number was found to be only one in seven people who have access to diabetes. So it's a, it's a, it's a diverse um, access of diabetes. Although we know that there are a lot, even in the developed or uh, the or the rich countries like United States that I will, I will show you that how people are struggling, uh, how people are struggling to buy insulin in a rich country. And um, I've already mentioned it uh, that in, in Lawrence at that time declared that now modern discoveries, particularly insulin have completely changed the outlook and there is no reason why a diabetic person should not live if he can taught to do so. So, in the, in the gaps of desired outcomes, if you say this unmet needs in diabetes care, you see that, that in our success today, we see that about, about of the estimated 450 million, and which is now is round to be 570 million in the last atlas, so we're changing it. About 50% of the people remain undiagnosed and that has not changed. We see that still we are saying that about 50% of the people are not diagnosed. That means we are not giving any kind of treatment to this 50% of the people. Those people, these 50% these of the people of whom about 50% receive care. So about uh, that, that means that means this 2.5 million receive care. And of whom 50% achieve treatment targets. That means we are talking about 1.25 million people who achieve the treatment targets and of a home 50 percent achieved desired outcomes that is a, that is 75,000 75,000 it's about six percent of the people with diabetes actually we are achieving the desired outcomes there at the moment so this is the picture that we should we should all look back we scientists we clinicians we should look back and we try to see that what is why what is the gap why it is happening why we are we are not successful in 30 percent 50 percent but we are actually ending up with six percent if you look at this for example in this type i would say that this is a policy failure that white people should have 50 percent diagnosed this is the healthcare 
the healthcare service failures that we are not providing the right care, and this is the treatment failure. The last two part is a treatment failure, which is the responsibility of the clinicians and the scientists to see that why the treatments are failing. If you look at the cost of production and government procurement in public private sectors, if you see this, for example, on your side, on your left hand side, you see the prices per 10 ml. So equivalent. So, so what is the prices? Uh, and this is on your on your right hand side. You will see the cost of production, the government procurement price, pri patient prices, patient prices, private sector, cost of production, government procurement, and so this is for human insulin, and this is for the analogs. If you look at this uh, at this cost of production, for example, in in the in the, in analogs, in patient uh, service. The, for example, the 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 uh, the, the minimum is five eighty nine. The median is thirty nine. The maximum is two hundred and fifty dollar. Can we live? Can we live in this? This data is collected from forty three countries, and this was published only last year in twenty twenty one. If you look at the availability of insulin on public and private sector in a variety of countries in sub-Saharan Africa, as I said, that only one in seven people have access to diabetes uh, to to insulin. You see, this this is the public, this is the private, this is the private sector. So you see that how it differs from countries to countries, and as well the availability, and and at different sectors. So if it is not available, the price becomes even much more higher. If you look at this, for example, how this price, this this price, uh, these prices actually was increasing. For example, the rapid acting analogs that you see that, because this is the highest demand, and then you can see that how this has escalated over the years from from 1997 to 2015. So this this should this should give us some thought that when we discuss when you discuss with our colleagues, which is very important in the pharmaceutical industries to see that we have a common responsibility. We have a common responsibility. We cannot only think of profit. So, so, my, so dear colleagues and friends, we should take it. It is our responsibility that we, uh, we put a focus on this issue. As we know that Biden, December on 2021, he said, imagine what it is like to look at your child who needs insulin and have no idea how you are going to pay for it. Biden said, let's cap the cost of insulin at $1.35 a month so everyone can afford it. Biden added that drug companies will still do very, very well. So, so you see that there is a question is that how much profit we need to make in order to, because I think that it is important that companies need to make profit in order to make new discoveries and in order to secure the market, the global market. But it's question how much. This is also the another another uh, picture from, for example, these countries from Africa. I'm focusing on on Mozambique, Zambia, Mali, Nicaragua, Vietnam, and uh, Kyrgyzstan, Kyrgyzstan, and Mozambique. So you see that it's, uh, in the, this was in, this was in Mozambique in 2003, and this was in Mozambique 2009. You do not see much changed. Much has changed in this in this uh, in this six years time in Mozambique. So you see that that's uh, that's that is quite that is quite interesting to see that for example how if you look at Vietnam compared to the other countries the differences in the central medical store that the public sector private sector and patient public sector so it doesn't vary much but if you look at for example Zambia is a huge difference in the central medical store to for example the private sector and this for example the public uh, in the public sector is is actually the lowest. So you see this if you look at Nicaragua, so it's a it's a it's a it's a it's a great varieties from country to country. And then for this, we also will have to bring in our government, our policymakers in a to alongside. And I think the IDF is now committed that we should develop our communication with the governments because the governments, the policymakers need to be taken it seriously. This is another picture. I will not uh, put more time. This also tells affordability on days. I will show you another picture, which will be easier for you to see. It is simply says that how much days wages you require to have your normal 
uh, to purchase your insulin. So, um, so, so then, then actually, it says, it's, 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 for example, if you look at, at for example, Brazil, probably it's, uh, you can you can have, for example, in in one day. But if you look at, for example, in India, that I think Indonesia, where is the, uh, the uh, Russia, uh, Chinese, Shanghai, Ghana, Indonesia, India, IP. That if you look at, for example, IP is is here. So we are we are not we are not uh, doing that bad. But uh, for example, Indonesia, that if you look at Indonesia, you need about 12 days of wage to, to, for example, to have your daily allowance of insulin. Affordability and availability in public sector uh, to the individuals. You see that this is also a table that shows the affordability scale on an average GDP and availability of insulin facilities visited where insulin should have been present. And you see that, for example, the the uh, the affordability is cost that Mali is is far far worse. Mozambique is doing somewhat better. Nicaragua is here. The Vietnam is is here. Uh, so so you see that this is a this is a this is a picture that is people are people are in the, that if you say that if you the countries that you have the health insurances, so it it varies to a certain extent because when you have the health insurances. The caps, the actually the industries, they actually they put the prices at higher because because the, actually it is not coming out of your own pocket, at which we are seeing the results in 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 uh, in USA. Now, what are the challenges? Mozambique and Zambia access to differential pricing, differential prices between government tender prices and prices to the facilities. And this is this is very important for the government because you see that the governments actually negotiate with the companies to to buy this buy these drugs. For example, the USA do not have this kind of policies because USA believes in free market, and that that actually so that means the company is at liberty to set the price any any price they want to. But for example, if you look at in England, UK, or in Norway, then we have the government tender prices that the government negotiates directly with this. So our governments, the, when the government instrument is strong, so then they, they are in a kind of better position to make this, this, uh, this um, negotiation. Insulin purchase locally is more expensive uh, and Mopito provinces equals, uh, this is at uh, this, uh, and, and if you see the significant differences in average prices in Europe and Southeast Asia that we see across WHO regions, the average prices of insulin from one company doubled from US dollar 15 per vial in Southeast Asia to US dollar 32 in Europe. So you see that the same same drug, same insulin varies a great deal in terms of prices from, from countries to countries. So if you look at this for the markups, so that what are the markups of, for example, on in terms of this Vietnam? So here you see that here you'll have to look at this. That you see that here it comes. Uh, here is the is the drug companies where they have hundred percent. You have the central central uh, facilities. This is uh, in Vietnam. It is you have to add, for example, five percent VAT, and that comes to the distributor. Seven percent distribution to other costs. So we add the other costs, and and then it goes to the public hospital, the wholesaler, to the private pharmacies, and that makes the final. This if you say the patients final final prices is actually it goes up to 124 to 136% higher and in the patient sector in the private pharma pharmacist it goes from 130 to about 150% higher so you see this is the this is the mechanism so it's a it's a big mechanism that we see that actually that how this market is being controlled if you look more carefully that you will see that the insulin payment journey that you actually you have three pathways that is the negotiated payment that we said that the government makes a negotiation and it's a rebate and is the product and the payment. So you see that there are there are several pathways and this is the this is the pathway for the negotiated payment. So you have this insurance of the premium that is uh, they make a negotiation and then it comes to the insurance companies health plan and the pharmacies benefit manager that they control this thing. So you see that he's a, uh, uh, and then you have this, you have this consumer, uh, and and then this negotiated from this part. So it goes to the pharmacy, 
to the drug wholesaler and to the drug company. So you see there are there are different pathways that you see that this these things that the, this is being controlled. So we need to understand the pathways. We need to uh, we need to understand the picture that I've shown here, the different mechanisms, the different pathways. So we question is how we can we can reduce these huge huge areas where a lot of people are making money out of the people of people with diabetes uh, are su suffering from this cost. So human cost decreased and life expectancy. That life expectancy at years, if you see that it varies very much, that this is a calculated life expectancy for type one diabetes in Mali, Mozambique, Zambia, Nicaragua, and Vietnam. So you see that, however, the Nicaraguan countries that where we often think as socialist country, they have a kind of better life expectancy compared to the other countries like Mali, Mozambique, Viet, uh, Vietnam, and Zambia. Now the new challenge is coming or a repeat of the past that is the human, human insulin to this modern insulin. So if you look this transition from this analog insulin, so if you see, look at this high income countries, the red is human, the blue is the analogs, green is the animal. So if you look at this, for example, the, the human, in the high income countries, the human insulin is falling and the analogs are increasing. If you look at this upper middle income countries, then it is, the, it is coming, but the gaps are still remaining between the analogs and the human insulin. The lower middle income countries, you see that actually the, this, actually this, this human, uh, is actually is still at large being used and and then the and then analogs are coming up but it's still not there but if you look at the low income countries actually the gap has widened it's simply because of the cost is because of the cost and if you look at it it clearly exemplifies that how these countries different countries people living in these countries will have different outcomes of diabetes treatment and if you look at this, for example, then they, this is here, you can see that, for example, if you said insulins, short acting human insulin, intermediate acting insulins, mixed human, rapid acting analog and long acting analog and mixed analogs. So you see that median days of wage, this is, uh, this is for the, um, for, from, it is uh, surveyed from, for example, here is surveyed from nine countries, this 14 countries and 12 countries. If you see that it's about, about four days wages that you would require, 3.6, and for example, in the median wages, uh, for example, the private retail pharmacist, if you buy it, uh, retail pharmacist, so it, it goes from three point, uh, about four days to about eight days uh, wages. And in the private hospital sector, it is starts from four to about seven days. So you see, this is the prices that we need to think that when we prescribe insulin, that we are talking of clinical inertia. But when we say that when you prescribe the um, insulin, how they will be able to afford the insulin and that we often do not think. Now, question is that what IDF is doing, I will try to say that what IDF is trying to do, that IDF has, have a kind of particular um, uh, initiative on IDF access initi uh, initiations and this decision on addressing diabetes in public health sectors adopted at the WHO Executive Board in January 2021. IDF asked its members to help mobilize national governments to support the decision on December 2020 to make an uh, to make an appeal to the to the WHO as a WHO resolution on universal access to insulin resolution on reducing the burden of NCD through strengthening pr uh, private and control of diabetes it was adopted in 2021 in May although we didn't get the, uh, the resolution that we wanted because many of the rich countries actually opposed this IDF's proposal. That IDF, not IDF, cannot make a proposal in the WHO. That many countries made this proposal on behalf of the IDF, but this was this was not so. So the negotiation was made, and then resolution was made on reducing the burden of NCDs through strengthening prevention and control of diabetes. So that is that is intact. But universal access of insulin, the countries, the countries actually which produce the three three major countries that who produces insulin, actually objecting the universal access of insulin. 
IDF access initiatives, they're the global diabetes compact. As you know, that we have been striving with the WHO and we have been able to create a global diabetes compact in the WHO. IDF is a key WHO partner for the implementation of the compact and regular cell calls are held with the WHO and the NCD teams. Over 30 participants from the IDF network participated in informal consultation with people living with diabetes. IDF was involved in the compact launch in 2021. IDF and several other regional members have, uh, have a, uh, participated in the, in the compact forum. WHO diabetes coverage targets that we said, and then we have all lobbied it together with many of our member, our member associations and their countries. And this was adopted by the WHO World Health Assembly in 2020. Too. And I think that is a, it's a great victory for all of us. In September 2021, IDF participated in a consultation with civil society and asked that 80% targets for diagnosis be modified to 100% diagnosis people with, living with type 1 diabetes. IDF asked its membership in December 2020 and April 2022 for help to mobilize national governments to support adoption of the targets. So IDF access initiatives in a special issue for centenary of insulin that we have made a special issue in the DRCP, diabetes research and clinical practice and a special insulin at 100 sessions during World Diabetes Congress that we are going to have a kind of a special session on insulin at 100 in the, in the World Diabetes Congress in 2022 in Lisbon. In April, uh, April 2021, joint webinar with NCDF Forum promises action supporting the implementation of the WHO Global Diabetes Compact. In November 12, 2021, joint webinar with FAO, increasing the access of diabetes care in the region. And January 24, 22, insulin, if not now, when? And then access to care of humanitarian settings that we have we have been uh, we have been supporting WHO is the essential medical list now they have actually they have actually included SGL2 in their essential medical list which is also that IB, diabetes have a, uh, IDF has strongly lobbied for this community engagement the members of the IDF network and people living with diabetes have shared their testimonials for the IDF insulin at 100 campaign. that we have the school modules of insulin that we said that to launch the World Diabetes Day on uh, 2022, we are working free training for modules on insulin. UN high level meetings on the universal health coverage, it will take in September, 2023, and could be an occasional uh, occasion for requesting universal access to insulin. So please take a note that there will be one UN high level meeting on universal health coverage in 2023. And please talk to your government to talk to your health ministry so that they actually support this initiative. The challenges of insulin is as in short, you can say high cost, limited production, heat stability and cold chain data from the data from a study carried out by Unigen and MSF transition to the analogs biological versus chemical entity, regulatory versus bio. So, so there are a number of challenges that if you look at, and it is not only an issue in poor and resource settings. If you look at the US insulin discontinuation was the leading precipitating cause for decay in 68% of the people in the US inner city settings. And that's, that is happening in the, because the government with the government do not have any control and secure the accessibility of insulin. This happens even in rich country. In Lancet, he said that what is the commonest cause of death in a child with diabetes? The answer from a global perspective is lack of access to insulin. So my dear friends and colleagues, can we sleep with these notes? Join hands to secure accessibility of insulin to all those who need it. Thank you and support the initiative of the IDF. Thank you.